Hello you guys, welcome back to my channel, my name is Heather, and today I will be talking about all of the books that I am biased towards. So this video was 100% inspired by Elliot Brooks, who is one of my absolute favorite fantasy booktubers on this platform, and she just did a video talking about all of the books that she is biased towards. And I was, of course, really inspired by that video because I think transparency is one of the most important things when it comes to being on the internet and having a kind of platform, though it sounds kind of weird saying that I have a platform, but I have my channel to talk about books and then recommend books to people who will then either spend their money and or their time picking up books that I think that they will like. So transparency is really important. I don't want to waste people's times. I want to convey 100% honesty. I want to make sure people know what my side is, what my taste is, in order to know if their taste will align with mine and thus know if they'll like the books that I like or vice versa. So I thought this video would be really interesting just to show you guys the books that I have a special connection to or not a special connection to because I will also talk about books that I am biased negatively about. Just so you guys know that I am a little bit more invested in these particular stories than you may be or I feel a little bit more passionately about these stories either with a hatred or a love than you might feel. I will also preface this by saying that it is impossible to not be biased with anything. We are human beings. We are naturally biased. Every single review is biased. Every single opinion is biased one way or another. But all of the books here are, like I said, have like a special something. Like I am connected to it in a different way than other books that I may also give a five star rating to, but it may not necessarily have that special link to my interests and personality than these books do. So hopefully that makes a bit of sense and hopefully once you see these books you'll kind of see why these are a little more special than maybe other books that I really love. So the first one I'm going to talk about, let's just get it out of the way, Song of Achilles by Madeline Miller. This is my favorite book of all time. It is a retelling of the Iliad and it is a love story between Achilles and Patroclus throughout their time during the Trojan War and growing up together as well. This book just means a lot to me. It's one of the three books that have ever really made me cry. I have a very, very special connection to this story and Madeline Miller's writing. In fact, I even got this signed by Madeline Miller. I got to meet her and she also wrote in my book, So Lovely to Meet You and Hooray Aphrodite, because I was talking to her a little bit about Aphrodite and things. So this book will always mean so, so much to me. When I talk about this book, I always catch myself saying this is an objective five stars. There's no such thing. There is no such thing as an objective five star book because again, everything has bias towards it. It's impossible to have a book be an objective five star because there will always be someone who does not believe that. But I say that partly because I do have this bias towards this story. But also, I just think that this book is so beautifully and perfectly written and it emulates the Greek prose fantastically. Madeline Miller clearly puts so much research and thought into the language that she uses, into the source material that she uses, and I also just really love how she kind of reclaimed the love story of Achilles and Patroclus that historians likely either glaze over or downright reject, and that's something I really love to do as a scholar. I like to reclaim those stories stories that have kind of been lost to history or mainstream history. And so this book just encompasses a lot of things that I love and that is important to me. And 
it has a Greek setting, which of course I am a lover of Greek mythology and clearly that is a huge central part of this story. So this really is the perfect book for me and I can't imagine any other book meaning more to me than this book does, except for maybe another book that I'll mention in this pile. Speaking of that book, might as well get him out of the way, and that is The Lightning Thief by Rick Riordan. Yes, my copy is an absolute travesty. This is the original copy that I read this for the first time in, and I just owe so much to Rick Riordan. I know that a lot of people grew up with this series as well, and this story not only got me into reading, but it also dictated the path of my career and my interests. So Rick Riordan not only got me into reading, but he also got me into Greek mythology, which then got me into cultures and religions, which then got me into history. And so without this series, I honestly don't really know what my path would have been, especially like career-wise, and I don't know where I would have been interest-wise and just my whole personality and aesthetics and just I can't imagine not being interested in Greek mythology is what I'm saying and I can't imagine not being interested in Greco-Roman history and its images and symbolism and history and culture and religion and all of these things. There's just so many layers to what this series brought me that goes so much farther than just it being my first kind of series that really got me into reading, that really got me into loving these characters and stories and things like that. So I owe so much to Rick Riordan and he's probably one of the most influential people in my entire life, if not the most influential person. And like he means so much to me that he's low-key like a god in my mind that is of course sacrilegious if you are a religious person to say, but I could not not even imagine meeting him like I'm pretty sure my brain would short circuit like my brain short circuited with Madeline Miller like I said one word and I started crying so I would probably have a heart attack if I met this man so we're gonna just keep him in my imagination we're gonna keep him in my brain far off and hope that I never stumble upon him on a cafe or at BookCon or anything because I would literally die on the floor so Let's not have that happen because I would like to live forever. So that's the plan. The next group of books that I'm going to talk about, all of these are very closely connected if you see the pattern that is on this channel and is in my reading taste. And that is anything and everything to do with Aphrodite. I'm gonna hold this one up because this is a lot heavier. I have a really deep, connection to Aphrodite that has been present in my life for a long time. It's something that I can't really explain and I don't necessarily know if I'm 100% comfortable talking about, at least not in this video, maybe in like a dedicated video. I do have a review actually for Aphrodite Made Me Do It that I can link up that I talk a little bit more about that connection, but I am also delving more into that and kind of just coming to terms with what that means even more with like maybe my spiritual journey and things like that. It's very big words that like, I'm still trying to decipher what all of it means. So again, I'm not entirely comfortable talking about it. But regardless of that, any book that deals with Aphrodite or has Aphrodite as a character or has Aphrodite as a major focal point in the story is going to connect to me in a way that likely no one else is going to feel, at least no one else who, you know, doesn't have that strong connection or pull to the goddess of love. And with this specifically, Aphrodite made me do it just connected with me in a way that very, very few books have ever done so. And I loved the portrayal of Aphrodite in this. Same with Lovely War. I think that Julie Berry really captured Aphrodite's essence into this book and really what she believes and the things that she would say and that is such 
an immense skill that as someone who does have this connection to her, I appreciate to no end. And I could not imagine being skilled enough as a writer to portray the goddess of love and beauty in such a way that feels just so authentic. And so obviously with all of that said, I am very, very biased to any books that have Aphrodite as a central part of the story because I just, I love her, you know? These first like three slash four books have a very common theme. I like Greek mythology. I mean, that's uh, kind of obvious. I don't think I needed to make a books I'm biased towards video to tell you that I am biased towards books that are centered around Greek mythology. I think we can all use context clues and make inferences that align with that fact. So let's move on to a little bit more different books that don't have anything to do with something that I literally centered my entire life around. The first one I have is definitely one that I have nostalgic goggles on as Elliot Brooks mentioned in her video and that is the Wicked Lovely series by Melissa Marr. This is the first YA series that I ever read. Right after Percy Jackson, I of course, like I said, got into reading more and I picked this book up and I was immediately drawn to the cover. The covers in this series are still one of my absolute favorites ever. I am not crazy about people on the covers, but it's just with the flowers that they all have and the darker tones that they embody. I have just always been so in love with these book covers. I've been a cover whore from day one. So of course I picked this up and I was really drawn to it and I will never forget that my mom was at Barnes & Noble of course because I couldn't drive. I was like 12. She was you know one of those moms who like made sure I couldn't read anything you know explicit. Like I was never allowed to read Twilight because of Breaking Dawn. And so she literally just like did this and she skimmed all of the books just I don't exactly know what she was expecting to happen. Like, I don't know if she was just expecting a dick to just pop out. I don't know how doing this would have shown her any inkling as to how appropriate or inappropriate this book was. But regardless, apparently that did not happen. Apparently a dick did not pop out of the pages. So I was allowed to get this book and she bought it for me and there you go. I read the whole series. I loved this series so much that I really wanted my sister's middle name to be Aislinn because that's the character's first name in this. My parents did not allow that to happen unfortunately, but like I tried. This is about this girl Aislinn who has the ability to see the Fae and it kind of runs in her family and she gets involved with the summer court king and he is convinced that she is going to break his curse if she becomes his queen and the series goes way more in depth with the fairy lore and the courts and the really evil nature of the fae that I have not personally read in other series. I think Melissa Marr captures the personality and the darker nature of the fae in a fantastic way and I have always loved the character development in this series. I have always loved just the character work in this series and I have always loved the fairy lore that she has incorporated. And I actually plan on doing a whole video review of this series. How many times can I say series? Once I reread the rest of them, let me know if you want to see that. But yeah, obviously this is the first YA series I read. I have a deep nostalgia towards it. I have reread it many, many times and it really got me into fairies. So love to see it. The next book I have to talk about is the Nevernight trilogy. I still haven't read Dark Dawn, but regardless of that character flaw, this is a adult fantasy about Mia Corvere who finds and goes to an assassin school in order to learn the craft of killing, if you will, in order to get revenge on her her family's death by the Roman-esque government. The reason that I am a little bit biased towards this trilogy is one, it has a really strong badass female character 
Two, it has a talking cat. Who doesn't love those? Three, it deals with assassins who are one of my favorite characters to follow. And four, which is a really big one, is that it has a Greco-Roman Renaissance-esque setting. And another layer to my love of this trilogy is it reminds me so much of Assassin's Creed 2 with a female character. Because for those who don't know, Assassin's Creed 2, the second game, follows Ezio, who is training to become an assassin in order to get revenge for his family after they are wrongfully killed by the Italian government. The links are very much apparent, which I think it's hilarious because I'm pretty sure I tweeted at Jay Kristoff once about how closely the Ever Night is to Assassin's Creed 2, and he said that he never played the games because he hated them for some reason. I I don't know if I believe him. How do you how do you, how do you not know about Assassin's Creed 2 when reading when like writing a trilogy that's like literally the same? Whatever, I'm not gonna question uh, Jay Kristoff's uh, validity in that comment, but regardless, this trilogy is just like Assassin's Creed 2 and that is my favorite video game of all time. Very similarly to Percy Jackson, Assassin's Creed has that like historical elements with the like fantastical elements and it blends with religion and different cultures and things like that. So very on brand for me. So to read a trilogy that not only centers around very similar themes to Assassin's Creed, but also has that female character, it was over for me. So I definitely do connect a little bit more to this trilogy than maybe the average person. And I am able to forget some of the flaws that a lot of people cannot forget about when reading this trilogy. The next book I have to talk about before we get into a little bit more of the negatives is definitely one that I knew immediately belonged in this video, and that is Wicked Saints by Emily A. Duncan. This trilogy has so many flaws, and I say trilogy, there's only the first two books out for now, but both of them have very similar flaws to them. They are not structured well. The plot is also not structured well. I know all of the flaws about this trilogy. In fact, I have a whole reading vlog reading the second book. It's spoiler free of me just conveying all of the flaws with that book. That being said, it doesn't matter how flawed these books are. This magic system and aesthetics of these books cancel all of them out. I cannot convey to you enough how much I love the magic system in these books. It is so closely aligned with gods and a pantheon and holiness versus unholiness and it's just so drenched in religion that I ignore all flaws about it. It is so perfect for me. This is following our main character, Nadia, as she is the last cleric of her country. And most clerics can only talk to one god, but she has the ability to talk to all of the gods. And she has been protected by her convent in order to keep her as a tool to combat the neighboring country of Trinavia and they have been at war for centuries and Trinavia also has like blood magic so they kind of go against the gods which is of course where kind of the unholiness comes in and the second book Ruthless Gods gets even more into the muddiness of the morality of the gods. Everything about this world building, magic system, history of this world that Emily A. Duncan has created is so perfect for me and everything I love about stories that I can ignore all of the structural flaws of this story. Similarly to the aesthetics, I mean not only is this book one of the most beautiful formatted books that I have ever read about. I just think it's absolutely stunning. She goes into so much detail about the atmosphere of these books and what it looks like and what it feels like. 
oh, it's just immaculate. It's just simply immaculate. And I love this trilogy so, so much. So now I just want to mention a couple things that I am negatively biased towards. And I think the most obvious one to point out is Sarah J. Mass. I do not connect with Sarah J. Mass's writing style. It just doesn't work for me. She writes this kind of, I guess, CW-esque fantasy where it's not fleshed out, really. It's very just supposed to be, like, lighthearted fun. You're not supposed to think too much about it. And when it comes to that kind of fantasy, I personally resonate much more with, like, Trisha Levenseller, for example, who kind of writes the ex kind of similar don't take it too seriously kind of fantasy. Sarah J. Mass just has a very repetitive writing style that I do not jive with. I'm not a fan of how she writes things, and I'm not a fan of how she writes her characters and how they're kind of copycats of each other. I'm not a fan of how she writes her male characters, like any of them. I'm not a fan of how weird her world building is. And this is to say that I was actually a huge like Throne of Glass fan. I loved Throne of Glass and Crown of Midnight, but Air of Fire, I always say, put me in like a five-year reading slump. Like that's not, that's not an exaggeration. It low-key did. So I used to really like her stories, but they just jumped off for me. And obviously, Sarah J. Mass does not need my praise. She does not need my support. And she does not need my money because she is doing just fine, even more than fine. So I will say I don't plan on reading another Sarah J. Mass. The only reason I read Crescent City was because Monty sent it to me. And so yeah, I really just I, I don't need to read any Sarah J. Mass ever. I don't need to do it because I know that I don't jive with the writing style. I am biased towards Sarah J Mass in the sense that she does not work with my preferences as a reader and that is okay. And the last thing that I'm kind of negatively biased towards is the complete genre of dark academia. One of the things that I hate most about people. One of my biggest pet peeves when it comes to the human experience and human interaction is people who are pretentious. You cannot separate dark academia from pretentious nature. That is just ingrained in the genre. It is usually just a bunch of rich kids or, you know, sometimes a poor kid coming into the rich kid group of kids who just think that they are superior to others based on their Western-based education. And that's coming from someone who does love to learn. Lectures were always my favorite part about school. I could hear teachers talk for hours about a subject so I could learn more. I love that stuff. That doesn't make me pretentious and think that I'm superior to other people because I have that specific education. And it always just reeks of privilege and elitism. And I hate it. I hate it so much. And especially because it's almost always written by white people who don't have the proper social commentary to really combat that privilege. I would be interested to read a dark academia written by like a black woman or a queer person, which I will be doing. I have Catherine House by, I don't remember who the author is, but I'll have it on the screen, as well as Victoria Lee's new book that is coming out next year that is also Dark Academia. So I'm open to reading Dark Academia-esque stories written by minorities, but not written by white people. I just, they never have the range. So it's not the genre for me. That is it for this video. That is it for all of the books that I am particularly biased towards. Please let me know down below what kind of books that you are biased towards, either positively or negatively. I think that this is a really interesting topic and I think it is, again, a very important discussion to have because we're all book lovers here. We are likely all reviewers here here as well. So I think it's important to continue transparency and uphold transparency and 
I also think it's interesting to just hear what people's like deepest interests are and the books that really deeply connect to them on either side of the spectrum because it says a lot about a people I think and what all of these books say to me is that I am a huge lover of religion, Greek mythology, and badass women so personally love that for me and my character. Thank you guys for watching and I hope you guys have a wonderful rest of your day. Bye! Thank you.